Welcome to Audiobook da Morgan. Today's reading is Uts, Chapter 21 by Bruce Chatwin. But before we start, please subscribe on my channel and press the button to activate notifications. Uts had an idea derived from Russian novels or his parents' love affair at Marienbad that a spa town was a place where the unexpected invariably happened. Two lonely people brought thither by the accidents of ill health or unhappiness would cross paths on their afternoon walk. Their eyes would meet over a bed of municipal marigolds. Drawn by the natural attraction of opposites, they would sit on the same cast iron seat and exchange the first stilted sentences. Do you come to Vichy often? No, it's my first visit. And mine. A rapturous evening would end in one or the other of their rooms. Either the affair would end in a sad farewell. No, my dearest, I beg you, don't come to the station. Or when parting seemed inevitable, they would take the drastic decision that would bind them for the rest of their lives. Utz had come to Vichy with the romantic notion that if the decision had to be taken, he would take it. He hoped he was sure to find among this crowd of solitaries a tender, middle-aged, preferably vulnerable woman who would love him. Not for his looks, that was, alas, not possible. He had always been ugly, but he did have other qualities. There had been occasions in the past when a woman had set her sights on him. On each occasion, when intimacy seemed possible, she had uttered the fatal words, Oh, you must see his treasures, and a cold draught had killed his affection. No, anything was better than to be loved for one's things. But where was she, this elusive female who would fall into his arms? Fall, that was the operative word. Fall, where he's happened to pursue her. He was tired of pursuing precious objects. Was she the still-haired American, widowed or divorced, he decided, obviously at Vichy for beauty treatment? Intelligent, of course, but not sympathetic. He mistrusted the acerbic tone with which he ordered her Manhattans from the bar. Or the soft-voiced creature, Parisian without a doubt, with golden hair and a melting mouth? He saw her first among the crowded morning at the Sault de Salestines, moving along the white trellis in a dress of white lace and a hat composed of layers of stiff and chiffon. She had been delicious and would soon be plump. No, not her. She spent hours in idle chatter in the phone booth and came away with a lost look, laughing. Or the Argentine. Grandi Manguisi di Viaggi or so the waiters said. Utz had stood behind her baccarat table at the casino, mesmerised by her scarlet talons, by the carefree gestures with which she manoeuvred her chips over the green bays, by the vein in her neck that bulged over a collar of pearls. Not her either. She was joined by her husband. And then he saw her one afternoon in the lobby. A tall, white-limbed woman in tennis whites, her dark hair plaited in a coif, slipping a cover over a racket and thanking, in a tone of firm finality, the over-eager pro for his lesson. Hutz heard her conversing in French, although he thought, or was he imagining this, that he detected a Slavic resonance in her accent. She was not the athletic type, there was an oriental tupor in her movements. I mean, she might have been Turkish, this femme in formigi vidon, with her apple blossom cheeks, her dimples, her quivering forelip and slanting green eyes. She wasn't beautiful by modern standards. The kind of woman they once bred for the seraglio. But she has to be Russian, he reflected. Russian, certainly. With a touch of tata, she was no longer young and she seemed very sad. He spent the rest of the afternoon in a state of feverish excitement, 
waiting for her to re-emerge from the lift and attempted to compose a history for her. He imagined the downward spiral of emigre life. The rented apartment in Monaco, later, when the jewels ran out the lodges in Paris, where her father drove a taxi and played chess after hours. To pay for his medical bills, she had sacrificed herself to the businessman who kept her in a certain style, but also kept a young mistress. He had taken the mistress to the Riviera and sent his wife, who was childless, to Vichy. She came downstairs before dinner, still alone, wearing a spotted grey dress and white open-toed shoes. And when Ut saw her little dog, a Sliumham, trailing at her heels, he called to mind the lady in the Shekhov towel and felt for certain the meeting must happen. He followed her at a distance into the park beside the Elier, stationing himself on a bench which he was almost sure to pass, inhaling the odour of lilac and Philadelphus. Viennes, Maxi, Viennes, Viennes, he heard her calling the dog, and when she came to a choice of forking paths, she chose the path that led towards him. Bonsieur, Madame, would smiled, and was about to call Maxi to the dog. The woman gave a start and quickened her pace. He continued to sit, miserably listening to the crunch of her footfalls on the gravel. At dinner, she passed his table and looked the other way. He saw her again in the morning, in the passenger seat of a silver sports car, her arms around the neck of the man at the wheel. He asked the concierge who she was and was told she was Belgian.